I'm Zach Smith for Route 113 Boat Sales. Congratulations on your new Cobia 280 DC purchase. We're going to start this tour off with uh, where you start every day, battery switch. Inside of this door we have our battery switch panel. Inside the battery switch panel we have four switches. First one is our port engine start, followed by our starboard engine start, followed by our house battery. When you're operating the boat, all three of these switches need to be in the on position. This switch right here, the yellow one, is your emergency parallel. If you get on the boat and your starboard and port engine batteries are dead, but your house battery is not, you can flip this switch and jump start your engines off of your house system. Coming over here, we have a series of breakers. First, these are our 24 hour circuits. So we have our stereo memory, our bilge, our accessory, and then down here we have our DC main. This is the main breaker. Coming over here we have our steering breakers. This is for our electric steering pumps which are located in the bilge. We'll talk about those in a little bit when we talk more about the Optimus steering system. We'll go ahead and flip the house back on and move up to the dash. Our switch panel starting at the top left we have our horn coming one over from there we have our nav lights up for running at night back for anchored at night middle position is off on that i get a lot of dead battery phone calls nine times out of ten we go out to the boat the switch is left in the down position mass light was left on coming over one from there we have our forward spreader light spreader lights on the bow of the boat lights up the bow for nighttime cleaning sitting or whatever you're doing at night on this thing. Not really a driving light, it is a illumination for the bow cockpit. One over from there we have our aft spreader lights. We have two, one port and one starboard for illuminating the stern of the boat at night. Next switch over is another middle position off switch. Up for blue gives us four blue courtesy lights. Down for white gives us four white courtesy lights in the hard top. Coming one over from there, if equipped, we have our underwater light switch. These are two blue underwater lights on the back of the boat. Next one over from there, we have our cockpit lights. These are blue lights that are around the interior of the boat, under the covering boards, in the bow, all over the place. Lights up the deck at night in blue. One more over from there, we have our compartment light. The compartment light is our bilge light on this boat. One more over from there, we have our live well. Live well is located in the port stern of the boat. It is lighted. The light comes on when you turn the live well on. This standpipe screws in. It is threaded. Do not try to push it down in there. You'll strip the threads out. Moving back up to the dash, our next switch is our fresh water. This boat has a few freshwater outlets. First and foremost, we have our sink. Coming to the back of the boat, we have a shower. Our freshwater fill is located right next to the shower. And up here inside the console, in the bathroom, we have another freshwater sink. Obviously, the freshwater tank must be filled, and the switch must be on for any of that to work. The last freshwater outlet is right here on the deck. There's a 25-foot white pool hose in your owner's bag you can use to attach to that. Next one down is our raw water switch. Put the switch on. Right on the back of this, we have our raw water. And then up in the bow, we have another raw water hose next to the windlass for hosing mud, muck, dirt off of your windlass. Coming over one from there, we have our fish box macerators. Port, up, down for starboard. 
This pumps out any water, blood, guts, anything that may be in our fish boxes. We have a, one on the port, one on the starboard. Macerators pump those out. They will not drain on their own. That is another middle position off switch. Make sure that one is in the middle. Next over from there, we have our windshield wiper. One over from that, we have our windshield washer. Currently, the reservoir is empty, but push that switch and it'll wash the windshield off for you. Last but not least, the manual control for your bilge is right here. There is a red light. Float switch comes on, red light illuminates, the bilge is pumping out. Or if you turn it on manually and the red light is on, the bilge is pumping out. The breakers for all these switches are located inside the console. On the back wall, it's gonna be difficult to see, but they are down there. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. This boat is equipped with our standard electronics package for a 280 dual console. That's an 8616 set in a glass helm, a VHF 300 VHF, a Fusion Black Box 300 stereo. Uh, everything's networked together, including the engines into the screen, the joystick, everything. It all functions as one unit. Uh, starting at the top on this, we have our favorite screen. If you want to add anything to favorites, simply follow the instructions on this screen. Step down there. We have our smart mode. Smart mode is really not applicable on this boat. If you had two or three or four screens, you could program it so when you hit fishing, something happened on each screen. Coming down one from there, we have our combo screen. In the combos, we have various displays of radar, sonar, and sharks. If you want to add any, simply hit menu and add a combo. Coming down one from there, we have our chart screen. Uh, we have five options for charts here. We're gonna talk about four of them now and one in a minute. First and foremost, we have our navigation chart. Navigation chart is gonna give you color shading inshore along with depth soundings, buoys, all that fun information. As we slide offshore, you can see there's not a ton of bottom contour information, but it does have our wreck and reef sites labeled. If you want to make any of these a waypoint, simply touch it and add a waypoint. <clears throat> Same goes for any of these. Add a waypoint. Stop panning at any point will center you back over your boat. The next option here is our fishing chart. In the fishing chart, we lose all of our depth shading inshore, but we gain a significant amount of bottom contour information offshore. As you can see here in the Baltimore Canyon. This is something that really improved when Garmin bought Navionics. Uh, the charts that were pre-programmed in the units improved significantly. The next two options here are a 3D chart, which is kind of a bird's eye view, kind of weird, not something I use very often. And then our fisheye 3D, which is something I, I really never use. It's a boater's eye view, if you will. Um, again, not something that's used very often. The fifth option is radar overlay, and we're gonna talk about that more when we get to the radar screen. Next thing down here is our sonar screen. We have a traditional clear view, side view, split zoom, and split frequency sonar options. Your traditional sonar is your B175 through haul 1KW chirping sonar. Uh, what chirp sonar is basically, it sends out a barrage of frequencies um, and different fish will respond differently to different frequencies. So over time, you'll be able to distinguish between a rockfish, a marlin, a tuna, whatever it may be, of looking at it and going, okay, I saw that, we caught that, I saw that, we caught that. You can really start to pick apart what you're looking at. Next option here is our downscan. Downscan is a 260 or 455 hertz band. Runs along the bottom, picks up every little detail like a scanner. Um, it, it is a tremendous structure finder and rec finder. It's a terrible fish finder because it is such a narrow band. So you use your traditional sounder for your fish finder use this for finding wrecks, reefs, things of that nature. Next one over there is our side scan. 
Side scan works exactly the same as down scan. This is the center line of your boat. Anything to the left hand side is off the left hand side of the boat. And anything off the right hand side is off the right hand side of the boat. A uh, cool thing with this is you can pause it. You can put your cursor on structure. You can hit the waypoint button up in the top right hand corner of the screen. And you can drop a waypoint directly on top of the wreck or reef that you were over. Next option here is split zoom. This is something I use some. Um, split zoom allows you to zoom in on one particular uh, part of the water column. If you're offshore fishing in you know, a thousand fathoms, you really only care about the top 200 feet. Um, so you can zoom in on the top 200 feet, you uh, mark fish and stuff there, and you won't see anything below that. So that is something I use relatively frequently. Last but not least, we have our split frequency sonar. We have a low chirp running on this side and a medium chirp running on this side. Um, some people like to compare, you know, different frequencies, different settings, all that kind of stuff on this, and you would do that in this screen. All of these sonars have some presets. So touch menu, hit the star, and you have your factory settings, uh, fishing sonar, running sonar, all that kind of stuff right here. Uh, really neat, they work really well and really don't need to be tweaked anything beyond what they already are. Coming one down from there, we have our radar screen. We have four options for radar, single range, dual range, overlay, and then dual overlay. Typically, I'll use the single range radar when I'm running in the dark. Uh, it's a hard red target on a black screen. It's really easy to see what we're looking at. Really easy to distinguish targets if you're running in the dark, buoys, other boats, things of that nature. Um, so that's the version I use most often. There are some presets built in here. So if you go to menu, hit the star button again, we have a bird setting if you're out rock fishing looking for birds. We have motion scope, which is what I use 90% of the time, which has live target tracking. We have harbor, we have offshore, we have sentry. We have a lot of different presets here. The presets are really cool. You can play with them, see what you like the best. Again, my favorite is motion scope. That's where I leave mine 90% of the time. Uh, dual range is exactly what it says it is. It's dual range. You can have one at a quarter mile, one at 12 miles if you want. Uh, again, I don't really run it pretty close up, black screen, single range, but this is an option. Next one over from there is an overlay. Um, not something I'm very fond of, I prefer uh, the black background, like I said, um, but this is an option you can overlay the radar onto your chart. Last but not least, we have a dual range. You have your chart on one side, you have your radar on the opposite side. This is kind of nice for running in the dark because you have your maps and you have your radar. Um, to turn the radar on or off, there's a button in the top left hand corner of the radar screens. You can tr turn transmit on or off. Last but not least, we have our one helm AB gauges and control screen. Starting in the top left hand corner, we have the Garmin Active Captain app. The Active Captain app is an app you can get on your phone. Uh, you can plug in waypoints, update software, make routes, all that kind of stuff right from your phone. Come down to the boat, connect to the boat's Wi Fi network, and upload all that information into your Garmin. Next one over from there, we have our vessel information. This is speed, heading, position, and depth info. Next, we have our media screen. This boat, like I said, is equipped with a Fusion Black Box 300 stereo. Um, this is the entire stereo control. There is no head unit on this boat per se. It's all run through the screen. So, in this screen, we have our source right here. We can select it from Bluetooth, USB, uh, Sirius XM, AM, FM, auxiliary, and then last but not least down here, our auxiliary two. Auxiliary 2 is going to be your Sirius XM. This boat gets its Sirius radio capabilities through the network, through the GXM 53 weather antenna. So it is run on Auxiliary 2. Touch that, brings us over to our Freeview channel, which it looks like it's been activated. No, it has not. So this is where all your channel selection will be. You'll be able to scroll through there and pick what you want, hit tune to channel. Volume control is on the bottom of the screen here. Let's say you wanted to pair your uh, your phone up to this. Go to Bluetooth, go to pairing. And we're gonna remove 
the device that's on there now. We're in Discoverable, so you're going to look for, uh, should be BB300 on your phone in settings, pair it up, and it'll automatically connect. You have a lot of options down the right hand side here for controlling sub level, for controlling balance, equalizer, volume limits, all that kind of stuff is right down there. As you can see, as you select these, it allows you to edit them down here. Next thing over, we have video. This uh, unit is capable of running uh, cockpit cameras, night vision cameras, uh, engine room cameras if you had them. Uh, and it can all run right through here on this video screen. Obviously, we don't have anything hooked up to that right now, but it does have the capability. Next thing here, we have our Garmin Verb action camera. Uh, Garmin has a tremendous product. They have a terrible marketing department. The Garmin Verb is an action camera like a GoPro. Um, they cost about the same as a GoPro, a little bit more rugged than a GoPro, and they, more importantly, pair it to your screen. If you get one, it'll network in. You can turn it on and off, stuff like that from here. Um, nobody really has them, but it is an option. Next thing over is something I have and I'm very fond of. It's the Garmin InReach. The InReach is a satellite taxi device. It runs about $400. The subscription is $30 a month. It's a great lifeline. It allows you to reach out to someone when you have no cell phone service. It can pair to your Garmin. It can pair to your phone. Um, and you can send texts to whoever. Stay in contact. Let people know what's going on. Next info here, we have our engine data. That you have to turn the key on for. This is all kind of redundant with the Yamaha gauge, but your engine data will come up here, RPM, all that fun stuff. As you can see, our battery voltage is up in the top right-hand corner of the screen. Next one here is our fuel information. Uh, don't use this. Uh, it's, it's not very accurate. I'm going to show you a trick on fuel information here shortly. And last but not least, this is our full-fledged Yamaha gauge blown up on the Garmin um, through the J1983 cable. Um, shows you everything from runner position, you know, where your engines are turned, trim, RPM, fuel flow, all that fun stuff right here on this screen. That pretty much covers the basic in and outs of the Garmin. Um, if you had set any waypoints, they would be down here on this list where it says waypoints. If you need to drop a waypoint exactly where you're sitting, touch the mark button. Last but not least, to shut the power off, press and hold the power button. I'm gonna leave that powered up for now as we go through a couple other things. <clears throat> Starting on the left-hand side here, we have our Optimus 360 control gauge. On there, this boat is equipped with the Optimus 360 joystick, Optimus 360 steering, Seaways autopilot, and Sea Station digital anchor. We're gonna talk about all this in this section. Uh, so right here, first and foremost, we have our engine RPM up at the top. We have our rudder angle down here at the bottom. Forward neutral reverse for the port engine, forward neutral reverse for the starboard engine. I got that backwards. I've had a long day. Um, coming across the bottom here, we have the controls for our uh, autopilot. So if you want to keep your heading that you're going on right now and just drive in this direction, hit the heading button. It'll bring up the autopilot screen. You can then jog left or right depending on what you want to do. Um, standby will override that and cancel the order. Track, this same thing. You can make your adjustments here, left and right, and this will pair in with the Garmin. If you have a pre-programmed route in the Garmin, the route light, the route button will become able to be used. You'll touch the route and it'll follow the route on the screen. Moving up to here, we have our joystick. Joystick is uh, something that takes a little bit of getting used to. This is a two finger operation. Don't come in here and grab it like a gorilla, you're going to crash into stuff. Um, the main thing with the joystick, the most important thing with the joystick, is whatever direction you're going to be traveling in overall. So if you need to go to the port and forward, but the general motion is to the port, you're going to move port first and then you can jockey it forward backwards you can twist the top here to rotate the bow one way or the other way but the general motion is going to be to the port you can come back to neutral once you come back to neutral the engines will shift 
I can put this over, move it any way I want. Well, as long as I'm over to the port side of the joystick, the engines will not shift. Um, so this is really important. We want to minimize the wear on the gear cases, which is why that is so important. This does have boost mode. There's a button in the center here below the joystick that says boost. That does exactly what it says it does. It turns up the RPM on the engines, uh, gives you more power, gives you more speed. Until you are very comfortable with the joystick operation, do not use boost mode. Get a very comfortable with it, play with it, go dock a hundred times, get very comfortable with it before you start putting in a boost. Boost is gonna get you up to speeds where you could damage things. Um, you have two buttons here. One says A, one says C. Uh, a is your heading hold. So if you're <clears throat> sitting in neutral, you hit take command to take command of the joystick. The joystick will not work until you press take command. So press take command, and then you can hit A, and it'll hold the boat exactly sideways wherever you are. So if you want to drift sideways, you know, down current, and you want the boat, bow, boat to stay this way and the bow to stay exactly where it is, hit A, and it'll hold your heading. C holds your position. So it'll hold you right here, but allow the boat to spin on its axis, get comfortable with wherever it is. A and C together is a position and heading hold, and it'll hold you exactly right here, facing exactly where you are. The engines will do everything for you. You simply press these buttons. You do have to agree down here um, to a, basically a legal disclaimer saying that no one's gonna go swimming while you're doing this. Um, and that's, that's how that works. Um, really cool technology. I love the anchor feature on this. I love the autopilot on this. It works great. Uh, the joystick, like I said, takes a lot of getting used to. It is very sensitive. A little bit of movement goes a long way. And again, pick your overall direction and then make your adjustments from there. This thing is, you know, can be tweaked any which way. Moving on up from there, we have our windlass switch. Uh, we have windlass up and down. Up here in the bow. have our Lumar windlass. This is really important. There's a safety chain right here. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it clips there on the chain. This windlass has potential to free fall. Please make sure this chain is hooked up at all times when the windlass is not in use. I've had a couple people not do that. The wind, the anchor fell, beat the crap out of the front of the boot. I don't want to fix it. You don't want to pay me to fix it. Um, so please make sure you keep that hooked up. So that covers your windlass. Stepping one to the right, we have our Yamaha 6YC multi-function gauge. On this gauge, it gives you all of your engine and boat information. Right now we're in engine A. You can toggle through engine B, which just changes the orientation a little bit, down to engine C, again, changes the orientation, down to E, which again, changes the orientation. On this screen, we have engine RPM, our trim level, our water temperature, our battery voltage, and our oil pressure for each engine on this screen. If we use the arrow to come over one to boat systems, this will show us our fuel level, our speed, our trip in miles, total fuel used, fuel flow in gallons per hour, and fuel flow in miles per gallon. The used is what I use as my fuel gauge. Boat fuel gauges are inherently inaccurate. They're a rectangle, they have fuel in them, it moves around, the gauge responds accordingly. So if you hit cancel, you come down one to used. Hit set, and set, it zeroes it out. So let's say for sake of easy numbers, you put 100 gallons in it. You zero this out, this reads 70, that means you have 30 gallons left. This is spot on, dead on, accurate to the 10th. Um, if it says you burn 70.1 gallons, it'll take 70.1 gallons to fill it back up. It is amazing. Um, I like that. It takes all the guesswork out of how much fuel you have. So use that as your fuel gauge. Coming over one more from there, we have a combination screen. This is going to give you a combination of RPM, speed, uh, and fuel economy information. And last but not least, this isn't really applica applicable where we are. This is a troll mode. So you can come over to this, you can hit set, and then you can adjust your engine RPM using these 
arrows up to, I believe, 1,250 RPMs. Um, again, not really something we use a lot around here with current and everything. I think it's more designed for lake fishermen. Um, coming into menu, if you do get any alarms or anything, you can come into the menu screen. There is an alarm and a trouble code section right here. Uh, it, call me, tell me what the code is. I'll be able to tell you if you can still use the boat or if we need to come get it. Right below there, we have our start stop buttons and our main key switch. So, this is in a digital start engine. So, what that means is the key needs to be turned to the on position. So, turn that on, push to start, push to start. The lanyard must be hooked up. I get this call once a week. Um, People call me, they yell at me, they scream at me. My new boat won't start. When I crank it, there's an alarm. It's because the laner's not hooked up. If the laner's not hooked up, you will not be able to start your boat. The other kind of call I get is my boat won't crank. If the engines are in gear, the boat will not crank. They must be in neutral, the laner must be hooked up, then press the buttons to start. On this key switch, on this key I should say, we have one black key, we have one bare metal key. On that bare metal key, there's an 832 number. That is the key number. Write that down somewhere. If you lose your keys, call me with the number. We'll be able to order you another. Moving back over here, right behind the joystick, we have our trim tab controls. These are trim tabs with indicators. Um, if you haven't used trim tabs like this before, these are electric tabs. There's a worm gear inside of there. They move pretty quickly. I recommend just a touch and wait and see how the boat responds. Another touch, wait and see how the boat resides. Do not press and hold it. It'll end up laying the boat on the side. Um, just a little bit goes a long way on the trim tabs. Last but not least, over here on the side, we have our VHF radio. Um, everything is controlled right through this mic. So you can roll your channels around right there. If you hit 16.9, it'll automatically take you over to the Coast Guard channel. If you want to scan, hit scan, all, and it'll scan through every channel. If anybody keys up on one of these channels while you're doing that, it'll, it'll uh, key up on that one and you'll be able to hear what they're saying. Coming down below that, we have our menu. Menu allows you to access your DSC screen. Within the DSC screen, you can enter your MMSI number. MMSI is something you have to register online. I believe Boat US's website, you can do it. Um, you go and you put in pertinent information about the boat. That way, when you hit the distress button, which is located right there on the side of the mic, they'll have color information on the boat, stuff like that, so they know what they're looking for. Last but not least, to turn the volume up, hit the volume button, and then you can adjust the volume and the squelch with this wheel gear. Press and hold the 16.9 button to shut that down. Inside the slow box, we do have our USB for our stereo. On the side of the seat here, we have our adjustments for forward, up, and down. It is a power actuated seat. Also on the seat, our armrests fold down and lock. Press the silver button and pop them back up. This drops down or flips up to lean again. With that said, we're going to move to the front of the boat and work our way back and cover everything else. Starting the bow of your 280DC, we have two Paco pop up fleets, one on each side. We have our flip up nav light. There's a tab on the front here you can pull to flip that up. We looked at this briefly earlier. Inside of here we have our windlass. Again, make sure the safety chain is hooked up. And you have a raw water wash down right here. Coming to the starboard side of the boat, in here we have our bow ladder storage. Bow ladder comes out, clips in these two stainless steel inserts here. 
It allows you to board off the bow if you're at the sandbar or something like that. Moving back, we have our wraparound cushions. Underneath of here, we have storage. It is pretty dry. It has a pretty decent gasket on it, and it overlaps. There is a bow table that inserts here, setting on these tabs, that is stored in the ski locker. Over here on the port side, we have our waste tank pump out. This is for pumping out at the gas station, your holding tank. Stepping back here, we have our partition door. The partition door closes. Windshield closes. Allows you to block out wind and crappy weather if it so should arise. Down here, we have our ski locker. Inside our ski locker, we have our table and we have our holding tank. Moving over to this side, we have our head. Again, we have our sink inside of there. This is all lighted. There's light controls up in the front. In the back there, there are two switches that operate the electric macerator, which is the overboard discharge, and the head flush. The head flushes with raw water. You also have a toilet paper holder and a mirror in there. Coming back here, underneath this, we have our four Group 31 gel cell batteries. All the wiring is labeled, so you should be able to tell pretty easily where everything goes. There's also a battery charger. The battery charger is located right here. Plug an extension cord into it to charge your batteries on the boat. I recommend doing that when the boat is not in use. Those batteries are $330 a piece. You want to maintain them properly. Coming back here, we have our angle puller. On a slide, pull the pin up, pull the slides out, push it back in and it latches. Underneath of here, we have a storage area, small cooler, and cup holder inserts. We talked about the freshwater sink, remove the Corian countertop insert to use the sink, and then back here, we have our champagne cooler area. That is a cooler. Bottles can sit right up in there. This seat folds forward. Pull this pin out. Make sure you hold this out as you lean it forward. It can tear the upholstery and it locks back in there. On the back side of this, we have another cooler. Moving back here, we have our fold-out seating. First step is flip this up, fold that out, and flip that back down. Repeat the process in reverse to put it away. While we're underneath of here, we have dual USB chargers, one in the bow, one in the stern. Fuel fill is located right here on the port side by the rear tower lake. Moving to the back, we talked about the live well, you know how that works. So open your rear seat, flip the top up, fold the seat out, and flip the backrest up. Again, repeat the process in reverse to fold it down. Located on both sides, we have our macerated fish boxes. Again, these will not drain unless you pump them out using the switch on the dash. Stepping down into the bilge, we have access to our fuel water separators. Fuel water separators are located on the forward bulkhead here, right next to our PCM pump. This is the control brain for the steering system. You also have your two Optimus steering pumps here. These valves on the side of the pumps are your emergency bypasses. Hopefully you never have to use them, but in case you do and the engines get stuck port or starboard, you can open this valve, manually straighten the engines, 
and then close the valve again to lock them, and then return to port using your throttles to turn. If you look back here, we have our freshwater tank right here, our freshwater pump here, our live well pump here, our B175 through haul uh, trip transducer right here. Coming back here, we have our raw water pump. And then way back there is our bilge pump. Not really a whole lot you need to worry about down here too much. You do have a Apollo valve there for your uh, live well. If that is shut, it will not pull water in. Coming over to the left here, this access hatch gains you access to the rest of your through hauls running out the side of the boat. As you can see, all of those through hauls are grounded. Um, it really helps cut down on electrolysis issues. On this side, we have our under gunnel rod storage and we have our fresh and raw water spigots. Last but not least, up top here, we have our outriggers. I'm not gonna pull these out because we have a boat next to us, but we have a lock here. With that in the down position, you will not be able to rotate the outrigger. Flip that up, twist the handle, and turn. Bring it back down, center it, and lock it. Uh, the boat will come with enough rigging to do a single halyard setup uh, for both outriggers in your blue bag. With that said, let's hop down and go over the engines, and we're almost wrapped up here. So we're going to go over a little bit of information about your engines. There are three cowling latches for the 4.2250, two in the back, one in the front. Undo all those latches, you can lift up on the cowling, it pops over. Underneath it here, we have our oil filter. Right next to that is our dipstick. Pull it out, wipe it off, stick it back in. Oil level falls should fall right in between the top and bottom dots. If it's a little bit higher or a little bit lower, it does not matter. As long as it's somewhere in between those dots, you are good to go. Additionally on here, behind this cover, we have our spark plugs. Spark plugs are a 200 hour maintenance item. Um, oil changes are every year or every 100 hours, whichever comes first break-in period for this engine is the first 10 hours. Uh, if you read the manual, it'll tell you first hour do this, next hour do this, next hour do this. I'm going to tell you the gist of it is vary your RPMs. Don't run at any one RPM for the entire 10 hours. You want to run at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 2,500, 3,500, 4,500. Just move the throttles around. You do have to open the boat up to wide open throttle at some point during the break-in period. I'm not saying stay there for an hour, but you do need to bring it all the way up. The idea is to break the engine at the full RPM band, not just one speed. So we talked about uh, oil changes at 100 hours. Your first oil change, your break-in service oil change is gonna actually be done at 25 hours. Um, so that's an upper and lower oil change, a primary fuel filter change, and a fuel water separator change. Uh, we typically do fuel water separators and primary fuel filters every single year. That way we never have to dig into the more difficult to get two filters underneath the intake manifold. So again, 10 hour break in period, first oil change at 25 hours, then every 100 or every year after that. Spark plugs at 200 hours, water pump and thermostats at 300 hours, and we start inspecting conning belts at 500 hours. If you come around the side here, Underneath our forward water pickup, we have our lower unit fill screw, and then our oil level screws up top here. Pump the oil in here until it comes out the top. Um, these engines don't really run well on earmuffs. They should be running a barrel due to the dual water pickups. On top, or on the front of the engine here, you're not gonna be able to see it on video, there's a little tiny hole that's how your speedometer works. It works off of water pressure. If you get any muck, mud, or sand in there, your speedometer will not work. On the starboard side of this engine, we have our flush hose. Flush hose unscrews. You hook your garden hose up to that. Turn the water on, pumps all throughout the engine, comes out everywhere, um, run it for three to five minutes. Do not start the engine, run the hose for three to five minutes, and it'll flush the engine out. In this, there is a little yellow garden hose washer. 
You can get, pick these up at Ace Hardware, your local hardware store. I recommend keeping some on the boat. They are very prone to falling out. Screw that back tight. Your telltale for your engine is right here. This should be peeing at all times. If it doesn't begin peeing for the first minute of running, don't panic, that's not that unusual. Um, so telltale comes out there. You do have an oil drain for the upper engine oil underneath of this chap, but we recommend sucking the oil out through the dipstick. Uh, on the back of the boat here, Bennett bolt trim tabs with anodes. That is one anode. You have another anode underneath of there. You have another anode on the back under this cavitation plate. Those are as needed maintenance items. Um, some boats, if they're being kept on lifts or in marinas without a lot of current, um, electric current, I should say, they may never need to be replaced. We keep an eye on them. We replace those as needed. Uh, right next to your trim tabs, you have your underwater lights. Control with the switch on the dash like we talked about. And then here on your right rear lifting eye, we have our drain plug. It does have an O-ring on it. Do not over tighten it, finger tight only. Uh, you shouldn't ever have any problems. A lot of people have a tendency to over tighten them. They crack the O-ring and it leaks very, very slowly. So to recap, 10 hours, very RPMs, 25 hours your first oil change, 100 hours a year after that. Um, as always, if you have any other questions or anything we've covered in the video, please feel free to call 302-436-1737 or email uh, myself or Joe here at the shop and we'll be able to take care of anything you need. Uh, congratulations on your new purchase. Again, if you need anything, please don't hesitate to call.